I'm Christoph Lamita, and usually I talk about uh, some very highly specialized uh, memory management subjects. And I had a talk along, uh, what, 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 six months ago with uh, Brian Webster, and he said, we really need some talk that uh, introduces people to memory management because this is awfully complicated. And uh, let's see that we can get some people who also understand what we are doing there. It may just be completely strange for people what we're talking about. So this is just a talk to introduce uh, the basics of memory management and gets you going to maybe do some uh, small things with, uh, with memory and understand what the kernel is doing with memory. Um, so we're going to talk about what kernel memory, user space memory and processes, uh, about real and virtual memory, um, paging, how to figure out the machine configuration, what's going to be is in your machine, machine and physical memory, um, figuring out how processes use memory, Talk a little bit about overcommit, and then uh, got gazillionness of other knobs that change certain things. And if you have some time, we can talk about some processor cache issues. Um, so, first of all, um, how does memory actually look like from the physical standpoint? Uh, ideally, we think we have just have memory from byte number zero to byte number n, where n is in the billions of uh, of bytes. And we can just manage that linearly, but that's not the case. The, uh, we manage memory in, in pages, so you can think about that. We have this page, and uh, every, uh, uh, every byte is on a certain page. And the kernel can only manage these chunks of data called pages. And uh, so if you have an I want to n uh, size memory array of physical memory, then you have to split that into units of page size. Um, for example, if you have uh, four gigabyte uh, of memory in, the, in your system, then you have um, uh, these pages, uh, and you have about one million of these pages. And then um, you have the, all these pages have a number, and this is uh, the phys physical, physical uh, the page frame number. And so, uh, if you want to refer to memory, you refer to memory by giving uh, 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 the page frame number and an offset into the page. So you don't have a linear uh, number anymore to address a byte in memory, but you have a segmented thing. Where some bits refer to the offset in the page, and the other one refers to the page. And um, so the page frame number is a reference to the physical page that is in memory. This is, gets, this is it's still a bit simple. So the common size there on Intel is, uh, is 4K. And that has been the same since the uh, 90s. And with that, you get into uh, extremely large amounts of these frames in your computer. If you have a system with four gigabytes of memory, you have uh, one million of these page frames. And if you have a system with four terabytes of memory, you have one billion of these, and the kernel manages the stuff. And uh, there is a, an MMU in the uh, processor that is used to uh, manage these physical frame numbers and map virtual numbers to these physical numbers. So and that's where we get to the basis of paging. Paging has a, is, is a management of these 4K pages. Uh, processes have virtual memory, means, means they have a selection of these uh, uh, page frames that they can access. And they have an internal numbering scheme of their own logical address space. So in addition to the uh, zero to uh, four gigabyte linear uh, physical address, you may have the same thing going on for the uh, virtual address. And you do the same thing there. Instead of uh, page frame numbers, you have then the, the page numbers of the virtual of the application. And so the, uh, the uh, uh, way you create virtual memories is by mapping the uh, uh, frame numbers that are particular to a certain process to a physical frame number that gives you the physical access to the uh, memory. And to, in order to do that, you have a page table. The page table allows uh, you allows the processor to look, look up what is the physical, what is the virtual frame number, and then convert it into a physical frame number. And with that, you can control what kind of memory a process sees. And you can isolate processes, and you can have the same virtual addresses in different processes uh, spaces, and they refer to different uh, frames in the physical space. And this allows you to do an isolation of the uh, address spaces of various processes so that they are protected from one another. 
And typically, um, you have this, this page table, and when the process starts, it's empty. And this means when if there is no uh, frame number, physical frame number available for a certain virtual address, then the uh, processor generates uh, a fault. And we classify these faults into uh, two ways. But the, the purpose of the fault is to provide memory to the process. Um, let's say you, you uh, find, okay, this is uh, 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 an address that is actually reflecting a contents from the disk. At that point, the, uh, the operating system needs to uh, do an I.O. request from the disk, read the page from the disk into memory, and make it visible to the process. It does that by populating the page table with the fr physical frame number, and then the virtual frame number determines the translation that is necessary for you to see the data in your, uh, in your process. And that gives you uh, a major fault. This means the operating system needed to stop your application, needed to do a device interaction, get the data from somewhere on a secondary device, put it into memory, and make it available for you. We call that a major fault. Then there are minor faults. You access data from the heap or from uh, elsewhere where, you, where there is no backing on physical, on, on an external device. You just uh, need zeros. So the kernel will give you a physical page, to give you zeros, and make it available to you. That is a minor fault, because in, in this case, the kernel did not, uh, was not, uh, it was not necessary that the kernel actually did some physical I.O. The kernel just did something and give you, gave you immediately uh, the, um, uh, the memory area that you can use. And while doing that, the kernel can police you, and they can, the kernel can control, is the application actually able or allowed to uh, create this, this access? Is it allowed to access uh, the, uh, the file on disk or the device? Uh, is the process allowed to uh, create more memory for itself, for anonymous memory, for heap memory? And so this is uh, one way of the, for the operating system to control the process and to make sure that nothing untoward happens. And um, if you look at these um, diagrams, there is a kind of illustrate a bit what's going on there. Uh, memory consists of these array of the pages. And uh, you have a, an address, basically, that's split into a segment. That's the offset and then the, the, the page number. And so the, the offset here is passed through to the physical address from the logical. And the page number is looked up in the page table and converted from, uh, to, to, a, to a PFN, which gives it the physical uh, address in memory. That also means that multiple processes may actually refer to the same memory uh, or the same uh, um, PFN uh, without a problem. So uh, uh, it, doesn't, it does not require that every process has its own memory. They can share it, and the operating system actually can control the access to the shared memory via certain access bits that also, are also in the page table that control if the process can actually write to that address or not. So with that, we have uh, the ability to create a, a distinct address space for each process and police it. And that is uh, the basis of memory management. Most of its of stuff deals with, with those issues. How to give memory to a process, how to control the access of the process to memory, and uh, how to make that all fair between multiple processes. Um, this is an address map of um, a typical process. And uh, so, um, these are numbers, uh, uh, virtual uh, frame numbers that may then be backed by the contents of a file or be backed by anonymous memory. So um, uh, you have access control there as well, um, and uh, this is actually, actually very useful. For example, the kernel does something like a copy on write. Uh, this means uh, data can be shared between multiple processes and it's the same way, it's the same for all processes. No one of the processes try to ch tries to change the data. Uh, if the data is read-only, then you create another fault, and the kernel now can do a trick behind the process's back and give it its own memory, copy the stuff over, and so if the process modifies the data, the, pro the process gets its own unique memory address, whereas the other processes that are using the same memory still refer to the same page block with the original data. This reduces uh, the memory needed uh, to a large extent and uh, allows you to um, 
uh, share a lot of the data in, this, in the system. Um, the page table also has um, other features. Um, for example, we may run low on memory and uh, we may uh, want to uh, push stuff out to uh, swap. We can uh, replace uh, the uh, uh, page table entry with a number that indicates where on disk did we save this data. We can get back, go back to it later. With that, we, we can make the, uh, the uh, page av available for other users. And the kernel does that by uh, calculating how much memory pressure is there, is it worth doing it, uh, how, uh, how often was this page used, and if it hasn't been used for a while, and then the kernel assumes, okay, this may not be used in the future, it may be worth to get rid of this page. So the kernel does dynamic memory reclaim and uh, tries to keep the data set that's most frequently used in memory. Then there are zero pages. I, um, uh, usually, a process starts out with just with, uh, with zeros, and we have a one special page that's called the zero page that is read only and that can be mapped into all of the uh, 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 memory areas of all the, on all the, the, the virtual uh, page numbers of a process. If you do that, you have just one page that's present everywhere, and you, it looks like the whole address space is just zeros, and that's very useful if you have large areas of uh, memory that uh, are initial, uninitialized and must just show up as zero. You can have a, a 10 gigabyte uh, a file of uh, a RAM range of zeros, and it's just one single page. It's, it's, it can be actually larger than, than the whole of memory, because we're only using one physical page, and we have all these uh, logical addresses that are just replicating the, the zero page. And uh, this means that uh, the, uh, there can be a huge difference between the amount of virtual memory that your process has, or the virtual memory ranges, and the actual physical <laughs> memory and the amount of physical pages that are required to uh, uh, make this uh, address space visible and make this, uh, the uh, address space the way it is for the, for the process. And so this is, results in an, often in confusion because now we have a virtual memory that may be much larger than physical memory. So um, then we have the, uh, the data may actually also be written to, and if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's a data that was written from disk and you um, write to it, you may want to write it back to disk. This means that the data isn't marked as dirty. So this, this means the kernel must at some point schedule this page to be written back to disk. And with that, we can also uh, we come and get into another situation where we use the uh, uh, access bits on a, on a page table. If the page is, is dirty and the kernel decides to write it back, it marks the page as read-only to prevent further accesses and uh, so make, make the page go uh, to, to undergo I.O. So um, at that point, then, uh, the process will be stopped if it accesses the page or has to modify it once more because the data hasn't been written to disk yet. So uh, the page table entry is also uh, one way to serialize I.O. and push the, and, and, and a way to control how data is being written to disk. Once the page is written to disk, it is then marked as clean. And uh, this means the page uh, contents are reflected on the disk. And at that point, also, the page, again, is marked as, as read-only because it is not necessary now to write the page back. If it gets to be written to again, it must be marked again as dirty, and we must do another write operation to write the page back to disk. Um, then we have uh, a lot of um, uh, statistics here in, in the kernel that allow us to um, to see what's currently going on uh, with this whole uh, scenario. Uh, there's a file called procmeminfo, for example, which is listed here, and uh, it shows you what's going on in the system. You have the, the, mem, the mem total is the total amount of physical memory you have on your system, uh, how much of that memory is available right now, uh, then there's uh, the caches, how much, how many of these, uh, of, this, um, of this memory is actually reflecting data from disk, um, how much is uh, in, in, the, in the cache, uh, in, the, in the swap, how much is, is actively used, has really recently been, been used, how much is inactive and may be uh, pushed 
uh, out of memory or into a swap at some point. And you have the separation here for anonymous um, pages, which are pages that are not backed by files, and then the, the, the file back pages. Um, and you see also here the, the number one of dirty pages. The, uh, that, that shows you the, the stuff that's in, has been modified, hasn't been written back to disk yet. And that's pretty important for, to uh, determine how much of, uh, of a disk corruption would you incur if you would switch off the system right now. Because then that means that the data on disk will differ from what you have in memory and potentially is going to be inconsistent. And you see that there, there are some dirty pages, but currently there's no write back going on. So the system right now is waiting for the dirty pages to time out before it will write them back. And uh, then we, we have here an overview of the various types of pages. Uh, the pages that are anonymous, that we use for the heap, uh, shared memory, then there's this various internal objects of the kernel, the slab pages, slab pages that are reclaimable and unreclaimable. Um, some of the allocations that you make for uh, uh, smaller objects like inodes and uh, dentries uh, are covered by the uh, reclaimable uh, slabs, and they also get pushed out at some point uh, out of memory if they're not used. And then there's some data here on uh, how, many, uh, how much um, data is in the page tables. This is just the overhead that's used to map the virtual addresses and onto the physical addresses. And um, there are more commands that can be used to uh, establish what's going on with the, um, with the hardware. There's, there's a NUMA CTL, uh, there's free, top, and the message, which all give you various data points about the status of, uh, of memory. Um, often you also want to know how does a process use memory. And for that, we have uh, uh, other files in PROC. Uh, if you go to proc slash, then the, the pit slash the status gives you the basic status of the, uh, of the process. Uh, it shows you the uh, amount of virtual memory used. You can see how many um, pages are used for file I.O. and anonymous, as you said, for files and for anonymous pages there. Uh, so this allows you to see uh, the uh, uh, how much resources are being used by this, by this thing. And um, so, typically use PS on top, and PS on top also go back to the proc bit files and extract data and correlate them and show it to you in a nice format. But this is the basis on which they do these things. Then we have the, uh, the U limit. Um, uh, Things. This is uh, from, from the shell. You can control with a unit command how much memory a process uh, is allowed to alloc to be, uh, how much memory a process can can use. You can determine here uh, how uh, how many files are open. There's various limits here. This is uh, if you have a process running out of control and using too much memory, you can here limit uh, uh, how much it can do and uh, how much resources it can use. So we've seen that um, virtual memory can be much larger than uh, physical memory. And uh, we have called that an overcommit. We can have uh, 10 gigabytes of zeros, right? But now if somebody starts to write to this file and changes all the pages, then it actually the process at some point must use 10 gigabytes. And if your uh, machine only has four of those, and at some point you run out of memory. And so the overcommit configuration controls that. When will the system intervene and uh, not allow you to, to do these evil things? And um, there gives, there's a, a three different uh, modes, uh, modes in which we can uh, work. Uh, zero means overcommit, so it will allow you to do this as long as the system thinks it's reasonable. If the system guesstimates that uh, you do, are doing something that will cause uh, too much memory to be used, it will stop giving you memory. Um, the second one is, the status one is overcommitted. It just gives you memory and gives you memory and it will always say it's okay. It will push stuff out of memory and, and, and do other, all, all the stuff that it can to reduce other memory requirements just to accommodate your needs. The system will be very slow and will be not, not running cached anymore, but the system will give you 
the data. And then the, the mode number two is there's a certain ratio. And you want to say, OK, I will allow um, uh, virtual memory uh, uh, allocations of double the size of memory, which is realistic, or 1.5 times the, the amount of physical memory. And then we, I want to get an out of memory error. So this, this, this allows you to configure that. And uh, depending on the load and what you want to do with the system, you probably want a different configuration here. And then uh, we have uh, a lot of knobs here where we can control the uh, behavior of the VM. And most of them are found in uh, Proxys VM. And this is just a list of, of all these things here. And uh, you can find many more of these descriptions of, of these uh, uh, things and how they, uh, how they work in the kernel documentation. And uh, the, uh, these, this is online on kernel.org, but you can also find it in Linux documentation at min guide. And I just want to uh, mention some of the important um, tunables here. And most of this is called the, the, it's related to the dirty writeback. The problem is if, let's say, you modify a page of a file. And at some point, it needs to be written back to disk. The question is, how long should the system wait to do that? And um, for example, the dirty write by 26 allows you to specify in hundreds of a second how long uh, the page can remain dirty before an attempt is made to, for that to be write, written back to disk. And by increasing the, the, the delay, you can uh, avoid duplicate I.O. And you can avoid the system having, doing too much of, of I.O. Uh, for the price of uh, maybe having a, a contest of the disk that's inconsistent with what you have in memory if the system crashes. Um, then uh, there's a dirty background ratio. That's um, basically when does the system start writing back when a certain amount of, of, of memory has been dirtied. Let's say uh, the system dirties about 10% of memory. At that point, the system should be Starting, starting to scan and figure out how to write these things back. And it will do that in the background. This means that the application performance is not impacted. There's just a daemon running from the kernel, kernel daemon that scans uh, for dirty pages and writes them back. Um, then there's also a, another one here, the dirty ratio. This is a foreground setting, usually set to 20%. If you reach that level of, of, uh, of dirty uh, uh, memory in, a, in the kernel, then the application will be put to sleep. And so if the kernel allocates more memory, it's just going to be stopped, and the system will write back data until we are below the dirty ratio, and then the application can continue. This is more invasive. It, uh, by stopping the application, you presumably stop uh, the kernel, the application from creating more dirty pages, and therefore you are able to keep up with it better. But it impacts uh, the application. This is the global, these are our global settings right now. There are other settings that are per block device that you can set elsewhere, but these are uh, the simple global settings. The admin guide gives you more, more detail on how to do that on a different level. So um, here are the resources where you can find more on these knobs. And these are, uh, uh, there's quite a number of, of these knobs available. And much of what you need to do is to learn how to find these things and read the documentation and figure out what the detection actually means and uh, uh, deal with these uh, knobs. Out often, out often. Initially, often, these, these seems to be, seem to be strange, and it takes a lot of time to understand these, but um, that is required if you want to do the proper tuning of these uh, settings. And so this gives you basically a start on how to get into this, but ultimately, Without uh, continuous reading and studying of these resources, you won't get too much, get too, get too further into this. Yeah. So um, that's most of the stuff that I have on paging. Uh, any questions on this one? Yeah, so with major fault, uh, is there any uh, way to, or any flag which says if there is a major fault, call the schedule and return the back to this context when the page is uh, read from the disk? Yeah, that's what's generally happening. You, if there is a fault and it's a major fault, 
then the system will start the I.O. and then it put the process to sleep until the page comes, comes back, until it can, can continue, because the program cannot continue without accessing the data that it now wants, right? Uh, whereas a minor fault um, doesn't have that happen. And therefore also a major fault causes a major delay for the execution of, of, uh, of the code, so it needs to be considered as a potential impact. Potential impact. It's just buffers versus cache. Can we say how much buffers is being used? Pardon? The buffer? The buffer cache or whatever, page yeah, cache? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So is buffer, the, uh, do you consider it as cache? Or we uh, can say how much buffers are we using? Uh, the SXX the cache here, it shows you how, much, how, how many of the pages from disk are in memory. That's what you mean, right? I know the, uh, well, the buffer, right? Like writing buffer. something to There are many buffers. Okay. And they are all... That was supposed to be cached Network, from disk, disk, everything. Network, disk, everything, right? What? Uh, network buffer is, disk buffer is everything. Disk buffers are all the, 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 the 4K pages from disks that are in memory. Yeah. Network buffers are something, something different. These are used for uh, buffering uh, TCP messages. Can they be configured? Uh, the, not, not the network ones, but for the disk, the buffers. Can they what? Can we limit them or can we? Uh, no. Have, that has been discussed repeatedly over the decades, but uh, so far all attempts have been rejected there. Just to follow on from that, in that example you've got right there, what is the exact difference between buffers and cached and swap cached, and how can swap be cached? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, the, the buffers are uh, additional uh, parameters to the, the cache pages. It could be that the, the disk does not do I.O. on 4K boundaries, but on 512, if it requires 512 bytes or 1K bytes, and in that case, we have additional structures that are used to manage these refractional page contents, and this refers to that as buffers. The swap cached, yes. This means um, a page in, in memory um, may have be uh, reflecting this, the, the, the state of a, uh, of a page in the, in the swap area of the disk. And if you have, a, if, 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 if a page is, is, is coming there, then uh, the, the swap page is in memory already. And that's an initial state. When you start swapping, you, this, the first the, the page gets a number on the disk in the swap file, and it gets swap cached. And then you're going to evict this page. You're going to take the physical page away, and then it's, it's only the number on the disk. So this is the state before that, or when it came back and it hasn't been completely disassociated from the cache yet. Can you change the page size, like from 4K, to make it bigger or smaller? Why is it 4K? And what happens if you do make a bigger page size? What kind of effect does it have on the system? You're asking my, my, my pet peeve. <laughs> the uh, page size is determined by the processor vendor. And uh, there have been, uh, most architectures don't use four kilobyte pages. This is a particularly problematic issue that Intel has not been able to solve. Um, so for example, uh, Itanium <laughs> at 64K, or Power has 64K, ARM has 64K page sizes. Uh, the, uh, if you can't change it unless the, the, the processor actually supports that. And the, the, the support on the x86 level is 4K pages, or 2 meg huge pages, or 1 gig uh, huge pages. And uh, that is actually a huge problem, because memory sizes grow and grow, and so the number of these pages uh, increases forevermore. And with a, with a four terabyte system, you have one billion of these 4K pages, and the kernel now is cycling through this and figuring out which one is the least recently used one, and we, have a, then we, we end up with a huge number of scaling issues. And that is one reason why uh, we got into, uh, um, into the huge page uh, stuff here. Um, we are now having an extensive build out of the, of the huge uh, uh, memory subsystem in the kernel. The problem there is that we really can't have multiple page sizes in the kernel because that causes fragmentation. And over time, as uh, the linear memory is destroyed in the kernel, we can't longer allocate these uh, huge pages. So it's very difficult to work with them because you need to pre-configure the number of these huge pages you want on, basically on boot up 
in order to be ensured that they are always available. And uh, so, um, yeah, you see a diagram here. So there you have the mixture of, of, of 4K and 2 meg pages, and it, it just causes fragmentation. And at some point, you can't do this any, anymore. And so uh, we, held, uh, we tried to um, do something called transparent huge pages, where um, some pages that are contiguous in, 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 for, in memory can be elevated to be a, to be a two meg page. That works very well for heap allocations for uh, um, memory that, that's anonymous, but it is not supported by the page cache at this point. And that's one of the key issues, I think, that where we need to make progress and uh, where uh, uh, a lot of work is still to be done. We've tried this for, I think, for the last decade to get there, but we're not there yet. Um, with that comes the issue, yeah, how to deal with stick fragmentation, how to deal with the, uh, with the page cache, with two Mac pages, and Matthew is working on that. There's another talk later about some of the issues there. So um, this is an, um, an issue. Um, hi. When you, can you go back to the slide with the VM tunables? Uh, which one? The tunables? Uh, that one. Yeah. Um, on some of my servers, I have to change from using data background ratio to using... A bit? I can't hear you. Sorry. On some of my servers, I have to change from using data background ratio mm -hmm. to use data background bytes because the, I'm dealing with servers that have really, really large memory, like four terabytes. Um, but I'm not touching data ratio. Yep. Will you recommend that um, I do or that I also um, do something about it? Well, again, if you hit the dirty ratio, the application is put to sleep. And this may be noticeable to the end user because suddenly the application doesn't respond anymore. So you would like to, to you would probably want to have the background ratio uh, deal with that and have some background demon that tr tries to flush the stuff to disk. Uh, the, the dirty ratio is basically something that you probably won't, don't want to encounter. So when, when I change the, the data background ratio to use bytes instead, I don't have an equivalent data bytes, do I? I only got, got a few words there. Sorry. Oh, I, I have to use data background bytes rather than ratio. Bang? Is bytes? There, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a, a data bytes rather than a data ratio that I could use? Because I don't see a list. Well, this is a different way of specifying it. Ratio means it's a, it's a fraction of memory, of the total memory you, you, you want to have as a limit when this happens. And the, the bytes means you specify explicitly how many bytes must be there before you start the write back. And if you have the larger memory, then the fraction is larger too. It may get too large to trigger back, back, background writes. That's probably one reason why they told you to put the background bytes there, because that allows you to, to be more deterministic. Let's say if you have um, four megabytes of uh, dirty uh, pages and you want to start a write back. Sorry, quick follow up. So, yes, that's exactly why I do it. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there an equivalent for just Diddy ratio? Um, so I don't have to use a Diddy ratio, and I can just specify Diddy bytes. See one, I have I have never used that. <laughs> so, so. Right, that's, that's the ratio, yes. The problem with the dirty ratio is if it, if it really gets to, if it really gets a large amount of dirty pages in the system, the system may become unstable because it cannot allocate memory anymore. It's just constantly busy doing write back. Yes, now, okay, that is, okay, so. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? How much time do I have? Um, okay, with this. Um, so this is uh, the slide again on the, on the huge pages. Um, the problem that we have in the kernel right now is uh, with these 4K uh, small chunks of memory that, can, that become more and more smaller related to the overall memory, it is difficult to do large scale I.O. For example, my company regularly uh, pushes files around at our two to four gigabytes in size. And this is about one million of these page structs. And uh, this means that a copy operation takes some time because the kernel has to walk through the one million <laughs> page structs and has to update the state multiple times until it gets there. Um, we have very fast uh, networking. We have a 100 gig network. 
and it should be able to copy that thing in just a fraction of a second. So we had to write a special copy utility that will map, map the page with huge pages, and then it can copy the stuff in a fraction of a second. If you don't do that, if you do a regular, regular copy operation, you're waiting there for a minute or so for the copy operation to complete. So at this point, uh, this kind of stuff is hindering the performance of uh, um, uh, basic op system, operating system operation because of the smallness of these things. I've had a system in, in, in the lab that had a 64K page size, um, just for kicks for testing, and there is no problem there at all. It has the same performance as my specialized program that I wrote for the two mappings. Uh, so uh, this uh, actually bites us in many ways, even disk I.O. Um, we have had issues where if you write four gigabyte to disk, um, yeah, you have now to, the, the uh, I.O. system might have to process one million of these page structs, its scriptors, in the device driver. And the device driver maybe can, can only get 500 or so at one time, and you, you're pushing 500 uh, of these disk at one time continuously into the, uh, to the, to the device, um, so we've had to find special devices that have very huge uh, <laughs> support for large, large of these scatter gather lists where you can actually get the full performance. And uh, so these devices now are enhanced to have uh, support to linearize this, this stuff. And this gets more and more to more band age on the kernel level that we don't like. And I really wish we could solve this issue. And there have been um, a couple of ideas to do that. And one of them is to uh, have the page cache on with two Mac pages. So, um, any other questions? No? Okay, so, uh, any status about the moving garbage collector inside kernel for dealing with this problem? A garbage collector. Yeah. Uh, we already do memory reclaim in that sense. We have a garbage collector, but we cannot. Uh, uh, we have certain pages that cannot be be moved, uh, and that cannot. Yeah, that's, be... that's what I mean. Whether someone working on a movable garbage collector that's like package all the dirty data together and then give you a sequential big chunk memory. Well, um, I'm working on a project like that. I'm, I'm the maintainer of the slab allocators. And uh, I would like to make the slab objects movable. And some, one of the key hindrances to making, uh, uh, making memory defragmentable is that slab pages are not movable. If we could make these individual small objects in the slab allocator movable, then we could do defrag and we could uh, regain our contiguous memory and therefore avoid these large scatter gather lists. So what I'm at right now is uh, I'm, my stuff works with uh, Matthew Wilcox's uh, X-Array. And so I'm going to try to push that into the kernel after that, and then we can see how we can increase it. But this also means that uh, in the ultimate, if, if, if all of the kernel would, would support that, we would have a garbage collection pass like in JavaScript or Java. So if the memory gets tight and our memory is fragmented, then the system would spend a significant time, amount of time just looking through all the uh, various caches and see how to move these objects. And uh, the question is, is that, is that too good? Um, but anyways, if, if we need contiguous memory again, we can get there, but there will be a price to pay for that. So another idea that has been floated is to, sh to switch the kernel to, uh, to Mac only. So uh, maybe have, a, uh, have kind of a virtualization where you have a, a virtual uh, kernel running there that only does uh, two Mac uh, pages and run all the large scale apps in that one and run the standard maintenance and uh, demons of, of the kernel in, in the 4K VM. Yeah, there are a number of, of, of ideas how to address that. That would be one thing too, yes. <laughs> or convince Intel to finally do the right thing. <laughs> 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 well, there, there, there is uh, ARM64 does have 64K page size. It doesn't have a problem. Uh, so if, and there, I know at least uh, three or four companies that are developing processors to compete with Intel on, on the HPC front that will not have this problem. And there's IBM out there with Power9, which already has that solved. And uh, yeah, so um, I think the, the longer we move into the... Uh, 
uh, into getting everything more abs abstractified and more uh, independent of the hardware, the, the easier it will be to do that. And there have been various vendors that have been able to move all of the open source software onto a different processor. So I think it's going to be easier in the future. I'm very encouraged also about RISC-V, for example. We have a customizable processor. And uh, ultimately, uh, we hopefully will be able to address all our pet peeves because we can finally customize this uh, processor to our needs and not on, are no longer dependent on the manufacturers of the processors. Um, with uh, non-uniform uniform memory access, is there any concept of copying a page that hasn't been written to? Uh, the copy, copy page that's not being written to, it's just, there's not a reference established to it. Yeah, it's, but if it's you've got, when it's been modified. If you've got slower access to memory on another processor, can you copy it anyway? If you're slow? Yeah. So if you're a Numa architect, yes. so you've got slower access to memory. Okay. If you loaded, say, a shared library mm -hmm. in one process, mm -hmm. but then you access it from another process for the rest of that process's lifetime, yes. that's not good, is it? Yes, it's not good. No, that's true, yes. And for that, we have uh, 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 memory migration interfaces where you can actually tell the system to move the page to another, another uh, NUMA node. But you cannot say duplicate it. Right. Uh, I know that. <laughs> what? We don't have text yes, right. Um, I, I know the, my, my, old, my old employer, SGI, has patches like that, and we, 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 we posted them back in the, uh, the 2000s, but they were never accepted. So there are patches out there that do that, but uh, they were too intrusive. Yeah, but it's my migrate system. It doesn't duplicate the, the text segment. And he wanted a duplication. Any other questions on uh, memory? Four K pages, just because they're bigger, is that necessarily an optimal size, or is a sixteen K maybe a better compromise? I didn't get the beginning of the question. Um, so you spoke a lot about using sixty four K pages instead of four K. Is sixty four K like an optimal size, or is it just what people happen to do? Is it would it be better if you use like sixteen K or some mixture? Like, have you done any benchmarks? Well, for small systems, uh, certainly 4K is good yep. if you are in the maybe 32 megabytes. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> for contemporary systems, you should probably have 64K or two, even 256. Um, so uh, given the size of, of the files, that's probably uh, much better. There's another question. Um, I wanted to ask, what, what's the status on the page tables? Is it three layers right now still, like upper, middle, and frame, or there are more, or it depends? Status on page tables? Yeah. Is it divided still on three, like page upper directory, middle directory, frame directory, or it depends on the architecture? I'm not answering the question. So. Five? We now have five layers of page tables. Oh, okay, okay, yes, right, yes, okay. This uh, comes with the new processors where they have uh, the upper bits also mapped on Intel. But this is. Yeah. But you can customize that per, per arch. And so we already had petabyte support back in a decade ago on Itanium. <laughs> uh, there have been the uh, memory. Uh, Intel Update, and I'm trying to think of the generic name, um, persistent memory yeah. technologies that have been promised for the last couple of years Yes, um, that act as, appear to a system as DRAM. Yes. Has there been any, or what's the more modern um, plans for that, and does it interact with the memory subsystem or just mark it off and treat it as special? Well, there are various approaches there. Um, I sure wish I could get my hands on one. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so we're still waiting. I've done some dry playing around with, with f marking memory up as a persistent memory area and then playing around with it, but it doesn't give me any performance uh, numbers there. So, um, yeah. Um, 
you can configure it as a NUMA, NUMA node if you want it with some, with some aid of some special uh, things. Otherwise, it's just a file. And it's like a, like a disk medium. And it look, look like, looks like a block device to the system. And that's the most straightforward way of handling it, because then you also have the synchronization requirements addressed to the device uh, layers, to the block device layer. I think Dave Hansen has been trying to do the opposite, try to use PMEM as regular memory now. Yes. So it's quite interesting. Yes, he, he, did, he did this, this hack with the making it a NUMA node. Yep. Right, yes, it's a hub pluggable NUMA node, essentially. <laughs> right. Any other questions? Okay, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>